Good evening. Uh, today we are going to uh, discuss the 10th chapter that is wave optics in your syllabus which is just after the chapter ray optics. In ray optics we dealt with the particle nature of light and uh, in the 17th century it was Sir Isaac Newton who developed, it was put forward by other scientists but this particle nature of light was developed by Sir Isaac Newton. And he was able to explain uh, Snell's law of uh, refraction using particle nature. Now in that what he said is that if you have a medium that separates two mediums, that is let's say this is a rarer medium and this is the denser medium and you have this particle of light incident on this interface between the rarer and the denser medium, let's say with a velocity v1. Now this has two components, one along the horizontal direction and the other along the vertical direction. Now if I call this component here, the horizontal component as AB, according to his theory, this particle as it hits the interface and is now going to enter the denser medium, it will also have two components. The speed will have two components, one along the vertical direction and the other along the horizontal direction. Now, he said that there is an acceleration in the vertical direction, but this remains a constant. This AB, this, well, this component will still be the same. He didn't tell us why, but he said there is an acceleration in the vertical direction, but this horizontal, remain, horizontal component remains the same. So now, if you complete this and find out the diagonal, this will be the velocity which is uh, greater obviously because of this acceleration in the denser medium and this angle we call as the angle of uh, refra uh, refraction and if I put the normal here, this is the angle of incidence with which the, uh, the particle is hitting the medium. Now by Snell's law, sin i by sin r, ratio of sin r to sin i to sin r, from this triangle if you take, sin i is opposite side, ab by the hypotenuse which is v1. So this is ab by v1 into sin r from this triangle. This is ab which according to Newton remains a constant. Hypotenuse is v2. So we have this sin r as v2 by ab which is v1 by, sorry, v2 by v1. Now if this were true then we know that as the angle, uh, as the uh, light, ray of light bends towards the normal, this R has to be lesser than I because it is bending towards the normal if it's in a denser medium. So, since I greater than R, this implies that V2 must be greater than V1, which means the velocity of light in the denser medium must be greater than the uh, velocity of light in the rarer medium. Now it was around the same time that a Dutch physicist called Christian Huygens put forward the theory that light is wave nature. Now he was also able to explain Snell's law of refraction and we in this session will be proving Snell's law of refraction using Huygens principle but according to him sin i by sin r is equal to v1 by v2 which implies that if i greater than r that is if the ray of light is bending towards the normal in a denser medium i greater than r would imply that v1 greater than v2 or the speed of light in the denser medium is lesser than the speed of light in the rarer medium. So here we had a contradiction according to the particle nature put forward by Newton here the velocity of light in the denser medium is greater than that in the rarer medium. But if you take talking about Huygens principle where uh, he showed that uh, V1 greater than V2 or V2 is lesser, the speed of light in the denser medium is lesser than the speed of light in the rarer medium. So we had a contradiction here. Now in the, in the year 1801, uh, Thomas Young proved beyond doubt that light is wave nature with his experiments on interference of which we will be de learning in detail in this chapter. Also later on in 1850, 
a French physicist, Foucault, uh, with his many experiments, determined that the speed of light in the denser medium is lesser than the speed of light in the rarer medium, thereby proving that the wave theory is an accepted theory now, simply because this wave theory was able to explain, successfully explain Snell's law of refraction, showing that speed of light as discovered by Foucault is lesser in a denser medium than in a rarer medium. Now, there was also another drawback, that is, if we were to consider light as wave, we then thought that light required or waves required a material medium for propagation. But it was also found that light, especially from the sun, could travel through vast areas of vacuum, which did not have a material medium. So light was able to propagate without a medium. Later on, in the 19th century, uh, like we learned in the chapter Electromagnetic Waves, Maxwell came up with his idea of electromagnetic uh, theory, which said light was an electromagnetic wave and therefore did not require a material medium for propagation. So then um, wave theory was accepted because now we know that light is an electromagnetic wave which does not require a material medium for propagation. But again, there was a confusion. There was some phenomena like, for example, radiation pressure, which we discussed in electromagnetic waves. When sunlight falls on your hand, there is energy imparted and therefore there is radiation pressure. So there is photon. So this could only be explained on the basis of particle nature of light. Also, in the next chapter, we will be discussing a, a phenomenon called photoelectric effect, which can also be only explained on the basis of particle nature of light. There are other phenomena which we will be discussing in this chapter, which can only be explained on the basis of wave nature, like interference, diffraction, polarization, and even refraction successfully can only be explained on the basis of wave nature. So now we have come to accept the dual nature of light, where some phenomena ex exhibited by light can only be explained using particle nature. Other phenomena can only be explained, uh, phenomena shown by light can only be explained using the wave nature of light. And so now we accept the dual nature of light. We start this chapter with Huygens principle. But before we go into that, we need to discuss what we call as a wave front. Now, if you draw a stone in water, you know that the energy transferred by that stone will travel in the form of waves or in the form of ripples on the surface of water. So suppose this is the surface of water and you're taking a picture from there. If you've dropped a stone here, this particle uh, gets some energy and that energy travels forward on that surface of water in the form of crest and trough, that is ripples. So, let's say this is a crest followed by a trough and then followed by another crest and so on. So, this is waves spreading out in all directions. Now, if you look at all the points on this crest that I've drawn, you know that they are all equidistant from the source. That is, all these points are equidistant from the source. And also, all points which are equidistant from the source must be in phase. Where we have already learned that if we have a wave that is traveling in this direction, this is what we call as the crest and this is what we call as the trough. And we know that these two points A and uh, B are in phase. How do you know they are in phase? Because they happen to be in the same position on this line that I have drawn here. And here then the wave is now repeating like this. So they are in the same position and the wave is doing the same thing at both these positions. Here is going up. Here also is going up to the peak wire. If you look at these two points, even though A and C are on the same position, the wave is doing two different things. That is here the wave is attaining peak values in the positive direction. But here, even though it's on the same position, the wave is now going down. So these two points are out of phase. So to check whether the two points are in phase, they should be at the same position 
and the weight must be doing the same thing at those two positions. So we now know A and B are in phase. So if you look at this A and B, the path difference between the two is what we call as lambda. One crest and a trough constituting one wavelength. So this path difference between the two points A and B is lambda. So that the phase difference should be 2 pi because this is 0, we have a pi by 2 here, we have a pi here and 2 pi. So whenever there is a path difference of lambda between two points, the phase difference is 2 pi or for any path difference x, let's say the phase difference is phi between those two points. So that we may write phi is equal to 2 pi x by lambda showing you that all points which are at equal distances must have the same phase. So that's why I said all these points which are equidistant from the source, all these points must be in the same phase. That means, for example, suppose let's take this distance. This is, let's say, this is lambda by 4, right? So, because this is 1 lambda, lambda by 2, lambda by 4. So let's take all these to be at lambda by 4. If this x is lambda by 4, then we know phi will be pi by 2. That is sine 90. Sine 90, this is sine curve, is maximum. So all these points which are at equal distance, lambda by 4, are all going to be, all those particles are going to be at maximum displacement. That means they'll be on the crest. Such a collection or a locality or the locus of all points which are in phase is what you call as a wave front. So I repeat, the collection of all points or the locus of all points which are equidistant from the source and therefore are in phase is what you call as a wave front. So if you take, let's say this is a crest, okay, all the points on the crest as you know are equidistant from the source and because they are equidistant from the source, they are all going to be in phase and such a locus of all points which are in phase in the media is what you call as a wavefront. Now that you know what a wavefront is, we will now go on to discuss what is Huygens' principle. According to his principle, now we have this as the source. We know that all the points that are equidistant from this source will constitute a wavefront, which is what you call as a wavefront. And this, I drew this when you drop a stone into water and the uh, wave set up on the surface of water will be on a plane. But if you imagine this to be a light source, like a bulb, you know light can travel in all directions. So if you're going to take the locus of all points which are in phase, it will be a sphere around the source. So we now consider this as a light source and so these are spherical wave fronts. So as the wave travels forward, the energy is being, you know, the particles of the medium simply oscillate. But it is the energy of the wave that travels forward and you will see that the energy of the wave is perpendicular to the wave front. The energy is always transmitted in a direction perpendicular to the wavefront. Now, if this source happens to be a distant source, like for example the sun, by the time the light reaches you, the, the spheres are going to be very large, of very large radius, and a small portion of that large wavefront will appear like a plain wavefront. Like for example, if this source is the sun, by the time it reaches you, it's going to be plain. Because you have a source which is very far away, there are large spheres, spheres like this and a small portion of that huge sphere will be what you call as a plane wavefront and you will see that the energy is transmitted always. This is the energy or the wave is transmitted perpendicular to the wavefront. So I hope you understood what a plane wavefront is. There actually you have a source, a distant source. By the time it reaches you, if you are very far away, they are very large spheres 
and a small portion of that sphere will appear as a plane wavefront and since the energy is always transmitted perpendicular to the wavefront this is how the direction of the energy transmission will be so according to uh, Huygens principle see if you have Uh, Huygens is a Dutch physicist and uh, the pronunciation of his name is in Dutch is very different. Uh, so different teachers are going to pronounce it in different ways. So Huygens principle simply states that suppose we have a source and let's say it's sending out spherical wavefront. According to his principle, every point on this uh, wavefront will are in phase we know and they will oscillate with the same frequency as the source which we actually learned in EM waves where I said that the waves always have the same frequency as the source. So these are all now oscillating with the same frequency as this source and these because they are secondary sources, because they are also oscillating with the same frequency, they become sources of new wavefront or they become new, um, they become sources of new spherical waves which go out from them. So each of them will, there will be waves spreading out from each of these secondary sources like this, okay, and they will be traveling forward with the same radius because this distance traveled will be the speed into time and because all these waves are going out in the same medium all of them will be traveling with a speed v and in time t will cover the same distance so all these small points on the wavefront will act as a source of secondary energy or secondary source of energy or secondary source of disturbance and Spherical waves from each of these sources will spread out with a distance Vt, covering a distance Vt in time t. And now if you draw a common tangent to all these secondary waves, which are called wavelets, small secondary waves that come out from the secondary sources are called wavelets. And if you draw a common tangent to all these wavelets, you get the secondary wavefront at some time t. In a similar manner, if you have a plane wavefront at let's say this is at time t equal to 0, every point on this wavefront will now be a secondary source of energy or a secondary source of disturbance which will now produce its own spherical waves. Each of these sources will bring out spherical waves which are called wavelets, secondary wavelets and a common tangent drawn to these wavelets will give you the secondary wavefront after let's say this is time t equal to 0 after some time t. So basically Huygens principle simply says that if you have a spherical wavefront or a plane wavefront every point on that wavefront will behave like a secondary source of disturbance or energy and it will have its own wavelets traveling forward in that medium with a speed v and if you draw a common tangent to all these wavelets you will get the secondary wavefront after a time t. Using this Huygens principle we can now prove Snell's law of refraction. That's what we are going to do to prove Snell's law of refraction using this principle. So we have Snell's law of refraction. Okay. So let's imagine, let's consider this as the interface between two media, one and two. This becoming a rarer media, and this let's say is water or a denser media. We now take two. We now bring out a wavefront, which is, let's say, the source is a distant source. And like I told you, if you have a distant source, then you have a huge sphere and as it comes from a distant source, I cut a plane wavefront, a small portion of that wave, wave 
which is coming from a distant source, this is a plane wavefront A, B. So if I draw the normal here, this angle now becomes angle of incidence and therefore this is also I because if what we have here is this is a normal, this is an incident wavefront on the left side, this is what we have as angle I and then I cut the plane wave here, this is A, B, this I call I because since this is 90, this is going to be 90 minus I, right? And this is also 90. So, if this is 90 minus I, this has to be I. So, that is how I have marked these two angles as I. Right? Now, according to Huygens principle, every point on this plane wavefront will act as a source of secondary disturbance or sec energy, which will travel out in the form of small wavelets whose radius will be the distance travelled by that wave in that medium. So in medium 1, by the time this, this point here, this point here is going to act as a source of secondary disturbance and it's going to give out a spherical wavelet. So the radius of that spherical wavelet when it touches the interface would, uh, would be V1T where V1 is the velocity of light in medium 1 and in time t it would have travelled forward through a distance V1t. So using this as the centre and this as the radius, if you draw a secondary wavelet, that is a secondary wavelet, this would be the, sec the secondary wavefront at, after some time t. At the same time, In the same time, this is also, all these points are acting at secondary sources. We can't draw the wavelets from every source, but we will consider these two points. So, if you are now going to take this point, this is also going to act as a secondary source and bring out a spherical wavefront, whose radius would be V2T, because the, the denser medium, in the denser medium, we have, uh, the speed will be different, which is V2T, and now we know, that in the denser medium, the speed is lesser. So we draw a smaller one, which is V2T, a wavefront, a spherical wavefront, which with A as the center and the radius as V2T. Now we know that the energy travels perpendicular to this wavefront. So I draw perpendicular to this wavefront and this will be V2T. This angle is going to be the angle of refraction and we know that we get the secondary wavefront after time t by drawing a common tangent. So to this wavelet and this wavelet, I draw a common tangent so that this is a secondary wavefront which is the refracted wavefront. So this is the refracted wavefront and this will be the incident wavefront. So we see as it passes from rarer to denser, it bends towards the normal. Now, if this is R, this is also going to be R because, as you see, see, this is the normal that we have here. This is our refracted wave. This is R and we drew the tangent like this. So, this is 90. This is 90 here, this angle here because that's a tangent. This, because this is 90, has to be 90 minus R and so this has to be R. Okay, so this is what I have drawn here. This is a normal that I have drawn. This is a refracted wave and so we have this as R. From here I drew a tangent to C. So this is 90 and because this whole thing is 90, this has to be 90 minus R. So in this triangle, this has to be R. Now, that means... From this triangle that we have, sin i by sin r is what we are going to write. Sin i from here will be opposite side V1t by hypotenuse. This is a 90 degree, right? So this is a hypotenuse AC into, from this triangle we have sin r as the opposite side V2 
by since this is a 90, this is a hypotenuse AC. So we have AC by V2 T which is equal to V1 by V2. That is a constant. Sin I by sin R is V1 by V2 which is a constant as defined as a refractive index of the second medium with respect to the first. So here we see since angle of incidence is greater than whenever it enters into a denser medium, it bends towards the normal. So this R is less than I. So if R is less than I, it implies that V2 is less than V1. That means the speed of light in the denser medium is less than the speed of light in the rarer medium. So Huygens was successfully able to explain Snell's law of refraction based on his principle. Okay. We also need to prove um, law of reflection where we know angle of incidence equal to angle of reflection using Huygens principle. So that's what we're going to do to prove law of reflection. Law of reflection. Okay. So this is a plane mirror on which we have an incident light. So again, we take a distant source from which we have a wavefront, a huge spherical wavefront falling on this plane mirror. And this is, let's say, point A. I'm taking a small portion of that whole huge wavefront and cutting a perpendicular here. So we have a plane wavefront AB. And on this plane wavefront AB, every point on this plane wavefront is going to act as a secondary source of disturbance, sending out spherical wavefronts in the medium. So by the time, so we cannot draw the wavefronts, wavelets from all of these small points. So we just get two sources, that is A and B. So in time t, this wavelet would travel through a distance v1 into t to reach the point c, right? So that if you draw the uh, wavefront, secondary wavefront, this would be a large sphere with radius v1t with b as the center. During this time t, by the time this disturbance reaches c, this would have already started reflecting. So, if I draw the normal here, this is angle I. And keeping this as the source, we now need to draw a wavefront which will have the same radius as V1T because this is now reflecting and going back into the same medium. So, because it's not going to go into this medium. So, because it's traveling into the same medium, it will have the same velocity. So, if I take a, 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 a wavefront with the same radius, let's say a wavefront with the same radius, then this would be the reflected wave which is perpendicular to this wavefront. We know that the energy is perpendicular to this wavefront. So this angle is going to be the angle of reflection. I told you earlier that the energy of the wave will be perpendicular to the wavefront. So here using this as the center and the radius as V1T, we have a wavefront here and this in that time, by the time the disturbance travels from B to C, here it would have already started reflection from the surface and we have drawn another wavefront with the same radius V1T because both of them are traveling in the same medium. Now I can draw the tangent which connects the two wavefronts and we see this is 90, this is also 90. Let me call this as E. Now, if you look at the two triangles, AEC, AEC and ABC. Okay, before that, if this is angle I, you know this is also angle I. Like I told you before, if this is your mirror, I'm drawing the normal here. This is the incident wavefront I. This is what I'm going to draw here. This is B. AB. Now, 
this angle, this is 90 degree, right? So this will be 90 minus I. So that this also has to be I because this is another 90 degree. So this is a common angle. So if this is I, this also has to be I. Similarly, on the other side, this angle has to be R because if you look at this triangle here, let me draw that for you. This is the mirror. We have this here with this as a 90. This is E, this is C and this is A. Okay. Now here we have the normal. So this is R. This is R. Now if this is R, this has to be because this is 90, this has to be 90 minus R. This we know is 90. So naturally this angle has to be R. I hope that is clear to you. Why we took this as R. So then we have from these two triangles, we know that these two are 90. So angle A, B, C equal to angle A, B, C. A, E, C is A, B, C. Both are 90. A, C is common. Then we know A, E and B, C. Both are equal to B, 1, T. A, E equal to B, C. A equal to B, C. Both are B, 1, T. So we know that these two triangles are congruent and if they are congruent then angle I equal to angle R by CPCT that is corresponding parts of congruent triangles because angle I and angle R happen to be the corresponding parts of congruent triangles. So you see we have also proved law of reflection using hydrogen's principle. Thank you.